Good morning, everyone. Good to see you this morning. Let's all stand this morning as we worship the Lord together, as we lift up his holy name. He is worthy of all that we can give him. So let's begin our time this morning by singing his praises.
Thank you so much. You may be seated. Good morning, East Haven family. We are so glad that you are here this morning. If I have not had the pleasure to meet you, I am Michelle Mayfield. I am the children's director here at East Haven. So if you have little ones, sixth grade and under, I'm your girl. So make sure that I get to meet you today. We are so excited that you are here, whether you're joining us um, live on Facebook or the internet or radio, however you are here this morning. Um, we are glad that you're with us. For our family that's here in the room this morning. We are so excited that we get to worship together as a church family. Um, if you are a guest with us this morning, if you will um, look at your worship guide or in the chair back in front of you, there is a card where you can fill out to let us know that you were here this morning or on your welcome, uh, on your, uh, mm -hmm, this thing right here, worship guide. Wow, not enough coffee today, apparently. Um, on your worship guide, there's a QR code where you can scan and you can fill out that guest card online to let us know that you were with us. Again, we are so glad that you are here this morning. Let's continue to worship. Amen. Let's stand as we continue this morning, as we just continue to declare our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me shaken, I've never been more glad, cause I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never
powerful song. Have a seat just for a moment. <clears throat> I'm sure that as you receive your worship guide, you read a little bit about our special guest, Dr. Bill Hurt, pastors in Columbus, and his wife's name is Tommy Joe. And Dr. Hurt is currently the president of the Mississippi Baptist Convention. And we are blessed that he took time out away from his responsibilities as a president, but more than that, the pastor of a local church to be with us for today. We have a, what we're calling a deacon's day. It's a type of training through the years we've had, I've had deacon conferences and retreats and we decided to just zero in on a a day that we're going to be here. So a lot of our deacons or a number of them met at eight o'clock and Dr. Hurt shared a beginning initial message and it was powerful. Uh, Bill's a wonderful communicator. Some of you follow him on Facebook and you know that uh, he writes on a regular basis. He's actually written a book. That's also in your worship guide if you want more information about that. And he's a great communicator as far as communicating the gospel, God's word vocally, and the spoken word too. So we just witnessed that. You're about to experience that in just a minute as he preaches. And then after the service, our deacons are going to go back there. We're going to have a lunch, and then we're going to continue our training for about another uh, hour and a half. So we're very thankful that Dr. Hurt and Tommy Joe are here. I knew Tommy Joe a long time before I met Dr. Hurt at Mississippi College. His daddy's a preacher. His daddy was a pastor like my dad. They were, they were friends growing up. And uh, he graduated from Cleveland, came to MC, and that's where we got to know each other. And he met Tommy Joe. Tommy Joe is originally from Kosciuszko, and then her family moved to Clinton like mine before her 10th grade year. And um, so we have a similar journey in life, and her mother was my dad's administrative assistant at First Baptist Kosciuszko years ago. So we go way back. Uh, They both have stories that you don't need to know about, about me. So just move on quickly, shake their hand though, because they want to meet you. They're very personable, and uh, you've probably already picked up on that. Now, guys, two weeks from Thursday, this coming Thursday, two weeks, we start Hungry Men. So when you leave today, there should be uh, some of our men at the doors with a bundle of invite cards for your taking. You don't have to take them, but they're there. You don't even have to go to the Welcome Center and find them like you have all the weeks before. You just grab one. You don't have to say anything. And then as God leads you, you pass them out. This Bible study is not just for our men. It's for men all over our community. Some of them are active in other churches. Some of them don't go to church at all, and they may not come on a Sunday morning. They may may come for a big hearty breakfast and a study. I'm going to do a study on Proverbs, and then so breakfast at 5.30. We'll start at 6. We have a welcome and a prayer. Robert leads us in one song. I get up and teach for about 20, 25 minutes, this time on Proverbs, and then there'll be a table of men. Nobody's put on the spot, but as one person kind of facilitates and guides, there'll be questions that you'll deal with to apply to your life based on the study that you just heard as I shared that morning. So you can come in at any time, but it's it's very important. Y'all did a wonderful job last year of this. I think that's why we averaged 100 both semesters. It's very important that we pass these out and that we continue to pray. So we've done this before we started each semester since I've been here. So what I want to do is if you came to Hungry Men at least one time, I want you to come and join me up here. You don't have to say a word. I'm going to lead us in a prayer for this very important ministry. So guys, go ahead and stand up. Just stand right here because there could be some guys that are wondering. Yeah, just come on, make your way to the front. Well, I wonder if any guys ever go to that. Well, you're seeing that we do have some that are regulars. They never miss or they just come when they can. We try to finish by 645 so you can get on to your workplace, your other responsibilities. And if you have to leave a little earlier, it's not like we're going to call you out. You're free to leave, okay? So church family and guests, please pray for this session of Hungry Men. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, okay? God, I thank you so much for these gentlemen that uh, are showing support for hungry men. Just a chance for us to to, uh, gather around your word, to study. 
Your word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so, Lord, I pray that not only will we come and get our physical need of being hungry met, but more than that, our spiritual need as we share with brothers in Christ. And God, please give us all the courage to use this tool of this invite card to reach out to our neighbor, our colleague, our classmate, whoever it might be, to cause them to come because, Lord, it could absolutely change your life because this is really ultimately all about you. We thank you for today. We pray that you speak through Dr. Hurt in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. As our guys make their way back to their seats, can we all just again stand in honor of the Lord, in honor of the one to whom we sing. And we lift up our praises as we continue to sing this morning about God's faithfulness.
faithfulness, the hope that we place in God the Father that can be placed in no other. He is so, so good to us. Amen and amen. Well, you may be seated as we continue to worship. Our children are going to exit as they follow Miss Tricia, Miss Michelle, and our Kids Haven team as they study God's Word in in a way that is designed just for them. And as we continue in this room 
to worship the Lord now through opening up God's word together and allowing him to speak to our lives. There are moments when I sing the goodness of God that I can scarcely get the words out. It moves me so much because we do need to sing about the goodness of God. Let me encourage you this morning to open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, the 20th chapter. We'll look in verse 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians, let's mark that chapter as well. First chapter. Verses 22 through 25, and then we're going to go over to 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. On behalf of our executive director, Dr. Sean Parker, I want to bring you greetings from the Mississippi Baptist Convention. Thank you for being a cooperative church, and thank you for being a great church in the state of Mississippi. We appreciate all that you do to make missions a possibility in our great state. And I'm happy to be here. Have you ever known a preacher that wasn't happy to be where he was? I mean, every time a preacher comes, you know, he always says, you know, I'm glad to be here. Uh, several years ago when I was pastoring First Baptist Church of Canton, I was invited to uh, preach a revival service at the Madison County Prison. A- and I got up to preach to those inmates, and as we preachers sometimes do, I said, I'm glad to be here. And I said, and furthermore, I'm glad you're here. Which, which, really, which really wasn't the greeting that they were expecting at that moment. I am so thankful to be with my good friend, Hal Kitchens, but I want to talk about his beautiful bride, Kelly. And Kelly and Tommy Joe were roommates in college, and Kelly was in high school when, when I met her. And, and one of life's disadvantages for you One of life's disadvantages of you is that you never will meet her dad, Mike Vaughn. Mike Vaughn and Hal and I played softball together. And and I would imagine at that time, Mike was probably about 45 years old, but still could play like a 25-year-old. And I used to say this, when I grow old, I want to be like Mike Vaughn. And I haven't achieved that. He was a better athlete and probably a better person than me, but he was something else. And I just hate the fact that y'all get robbed by not getting to meet that great man. Now, Hal, on the other hand, (laughs) I I, got to tell you, Hal is a great friend and and has been since 1979. Hal's, Hal's a great husband. Hal's a great father. Hal's a great grandfather to his grandchildren. He is a great preacher, and Hal is a great leader. And Hal is, I can't read the rest of your writing. Hal is just, <laughs> I, if you, 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 you'll have to finish that up when you dismiss him a little bit later on. But I, 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 w- I was doing the absolute best that I could. I love you, Pastor. Brookhaven has the two most caffeinated pastors in the state convention with Hal Kitchens. And my good friend, Greg Warnock. Those guys are like mosquitoes on heroin, aren't they? They're just all over the place. And you, you never know what they're going to do. Between the two of them, they are great individuals. Let's stand as we honor the reading of God's word this morning. Hear with me now the word of our Lord from Exodus 20, 1 through 3. And the Lord spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now let's look in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 22 
and following. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said, Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And finally, let's look in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world into himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might have and become the righteousness of God. And this is the word of God for the people of God. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy and inspired word and all God's people together said, thank you. You may be seated. Sometimes pastors ask guests to come for two reasons, maybe to fill the pulpit, but they also want them to be maybe a little spy, to kind of see the campus and see the church on a Sunday morning, to maybe find weaknesses or maybe to find things that that need to be corrected. I've done that in every church that I've ever pastored. And and usually what I will do, I will have that individual meet with our deacons. And he will say stuff like, you know, I got all the way inside the church and nobody spoke to me. Somebody didn't hold the door open for me. Just just things that we kind of take for granted. So as Hal asked me to come to share with with his deacons, but also to share with you, He kind of wanted me to look around and to see if there are things or a thing that might stick out that you're not aware of. And that's happened today. I don't know if you're aware of this. And if you hadn't, it's it's pretty glaring. There is a big cross outside your church, right? Y'all know that thing's here? That thing is a monster. And I don't know if you had anything to do with putting that up, but that cross is hard to miss. And where you placed that cross in the proximity of this church means that this must be the church under the cross. Do you want it to be the church under the cross? It is hard to preach on the cross. I mean, thousands of sermons, millions of sermons have been preached on the cross. Countless books have been written about the cross that Jesus died on for your sins and mine. But it's only scratched the surface of what the cross is all about. Even the disciples had a hard time understanding why Jesus had to be crucified, why he had to die. The apostle Paul, on the other hand, said this, we preach Christ and him crucified. Now listen closely. If the church, East Haven Baptist Church, is going to be the authentic church that God has established, then the cross has got to be at the very center of our preaching and our teaching, and it's got to be at the very center of all of our lives. We know the importance of remembering specific events. Birthdays, for one. You probably know your spouse's birthday, I hope you do. 
or your children's birthday. I see, I, I see husbands and wife already turning to each other. Do you know? Anniversaries. Anniversaries. You don't want to forget those guys. You want to make sure that you're on top of it, not the day of, not the day before, but you want to be elaborate. All right, ladies? Now, she may say, don't do anything for our anniversary. She's lying. <laughs> she is lying. Anniversaries are important to remember. Special events. Even our nation has special times that we remember. February the 15th, 1898, the ship Maine was sunk in Havana Harbor. And all of a sudden, there went a cry across our country that said, remember the Maine, remember the Maine. When several of our country members fell in what we know as San Antonio, Texas, the cry went out that is famous, remember the Alamo, remember the Alamo. December the 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And then a cry went out throughout our nation, remember, remember Pearl Harbor. This past week, we reflected back to September 11th, 2001, when Al-Qaeda operatives turned passenger planes into flying bombs, flying them into the World Trade Center, into the Pentagon, and then one flight crashing in Pennsylvania. So this past week, we were remembering the 23rd anniversary, I believe, of 9-11. And we were saying, remember, you should never forget those things. The Jewish people were always encouraged to remember what God had done for them, how he had brought them out of Egypt, out of the land of bondage, and led them to the promised land. They were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And they were told to remember. Do you remember when Jesus met with his disciples for what would be the very last time? We are told that he washed their feet, he broke the bread, he took the cup, he said, this bread represents my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, you do so in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup that said, this cup represents the new covenant paid in full through my blood. Whenever you drink it, you do so in remembrance of me. There are moments in my ministry when I am serving the Lord's Supper to our deacons and I usually will hand them the bread and I will say the body of Christ, but I am so moved emotionally that there are moments I can hardly get those words out when I start thinking about my Savior on a cross bleeding and dying for me so that I may have life and have it more abundantly. We have to remember the cross because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen or what could happen or what the danger is for East Haven Baptist Church is that cross will almost become invisible over a period of time. And you'll drive by it and you won't even think. You won't even think because it becomes habitual. When we talk about the cross, it's an uncomfortable dialogue. It's an uncomfortable concept. And why is that? Well, number one, the message of the cross is difficult because of the power and the persuasiveness of sin. I mean, look at the world in which we live. Do you sometimes just think the world's just gone mad? The world's just gone crazy? Well, I can tell you this. From the very beginning of time, the world has been bad. And the world has been crazy. Billy Joel had that song, We Didn't Start the Fire. And in that song, he goes through the chronological time in the United States of things that have happened. And basically said, I wrote the song to say, the world's a mess, the world's always been a mess, and it's always gonna be a mess. Things are just more open now. 
Things are more in the public. Things are more acceptable. I mean, think about subjects such as casual sex. You know, I don't have to go that far. Just, just think about the power of gossip. I have had a lady that told me one time, she said, I never repeat gossip, so listen the first time. <laughs> Another guy says, you know, I, I never repeat anything unless it is good. And boy, is this good. Look at what your children are facing now in elementary school. Things that we weren't facing until we got into middle school and sometimes high school. And I will tell you parents, I will tell you grandparents. If you haven't told your child or your grandchild about everything they need to know about second grade, you're behind the curve. You are behind the curve. Because if you're not teaching those lessons, if you're not teaching those lessons, they're learning those lessons from somebody else. And when we talk about church and having faith being a part of our life. You know, I've had parents that have told me, well, my, my children don't like to go to church, so I'm not going to force them. I said, well, don't force them to go to school then. Give them a choice there. Which one's more important? The last time I checked, parents, your home is not a democracy. It is a dictatorship. And you are the dictator. And you dictate what they do. And you say, well, I want to be a friend to my child. No, you don't. They need a parent. They need a parent. If they need a friend, get a dog. That can be a good friend for them. But most of us now have gotten to the point in time where, where we just wink at sinful behavior. Because what the world is piping in is eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. Do whatever makes you feel good. But we're living in a feel good without doing good society. And the church has to accept some responsibility for that because this has happened on our watch. This has happened while we've been at the wheel. But we know what scripture tells us. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. It begins with God's people Becoming godly and returning back to God. Don't expect an ungodly world to start, start acting godly. It's not going to happen. But the church has to be the church under the cross. But we don't want to talk about it because we have those deep, dark, seated issues in our lives that some of us have never dealt with. Bigotry. Jealousy. Envy, racism. We avoid the cross because we don't want to deal with our own sinfulness. But if you lean in for a moment, I can inform you what God's word says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We all need the grace of God. Number two, on the other hand, we need to realize that some nominal Christians have removed the cross from the church. We've removed the church. I mean, we've removed the cross from the church. E. Stanley Jones, that great missionary, had this statement. He said, we have been inoculated with a mild form of Christianity, and we become immune to the real thing. The church, East Haven Baptist Church, the church, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, where I pastor, those churches are bodies of Christ. They're not country clubs. It's not that you come when it's convenient or when it meets my need. The last time I checked, the church is not about you. Never has been about you. I have another alarming announcement. Worship isn't about you. It's all about him. You see, the heart of worship is God's people understanding what worship is all about. You see, most of us look at it this way. 
that God is the director and the pastor and the music folks are the actors and you're the audience. No, that's not it. This is how it should be. The pastors, ministers, are the directors. You are the actors. And there's an audience of one. There's an audience of one. This is about him. And I get so fed up with people say, well, I don't like this about the church. It's not about you. Well, you know, I didn't like what the preacher said. Well, sometimes the preacher doesn't like what you say. We need to understand that everything that we do revolves around him. And the cross is our rallying point. Martin Marty said this, we have offered something other than the cross in the name of the cross. Cheap grace that goes along with successful living. That's what's being piped in to people all over the world today. Whenever we offer, listen closely, whenever we offer a religion with no strings attached, we offer cheap grace. Whenever we offer a religion with no cost, we offer cheap grace. Whenever we offer a religion with no commitment, we offer cheap grace. Whenever we lift a hollow aluminum cross rather than a heavy wooden cross, we are guilty of heresy in our message to the world. Look at the words that Jesus spoke for a moment. The foxes of the field have their holes. The birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay down his head. He said, if anyone is going to follow me, they have to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Straight is the gate that leads to life, and it is narrow, and very few find it. You must forsake your father and your mother, then you come and follow me. To Nicodemus, a leader of the law, he said, you must be born again. And to the rich young ruler, he told him, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, and then you come and follow me. The medicine label on the church reads this way, admit, repent, believe, be converted. That's your message. If you and I are going to follow Christ, we have to be made in his image. You cannot cling to your selfishness. You can't cling to your bigotry. You can't cling to your prejudices. Jesus often demands inconveniences in our life. And we always want things to be convenient. Next, Paul declared in our passage that reconciliation by the cross is at the very center of the church's message. Reconciliation by the cross is the very center of the church's message. Reconciliation begins with our own awareness of sin the sin that I have in my life. I, I love talking to children about a salvation experience. I really do, especially like an eight or nine-year-old. And you're sitting down with them, and mama or daddy's brought them to the pastor's office, you know, because we got to give our stamp of approval or whatever it is. They just want the pastor to say everything's okay. And when I talk to those children, I'll say, you know, Scripture tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I said, are you a sinner? I'll say, yes, sir. I said, is your mama a sinner? Yes, sir. What about your dad? Oh, he sins big. He, 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 he sins big. And then I'll say, what about the pastor? And they're kind of confused on that one. And I'll say, I sin just like you sin. But for many of us, you know what our sin is? And I can tell you, it's why we're in the mess we're in right now as a country. Our biggest sin is indifference. It's just indifference. And we've just allowed this worldview culture 
to just inundate our society because we hadn't done anything. Do you know what the fastest growing religion in the state of Mississippi is? It's the nuns. You're waiting, aren't you? All right, so when I say the nuns, that's N-O-N-E. None. No church affiliation. Last year, this is in the Bible Belt, the state of Mississippi, 38% of Mississippians said they have an affiliation with a, with a church family. Let that sink in for a moment. 38%. You want something even more alarming? It's taking place in the great state of Mississippi. One third, one third, and this is of believers. One third of believers believe that Jesus is the only way. So our indifference has led to an indifference in society. And we've also become self-centered because we want everything to be around us. We celebrated our grandson, our second grandson's birthday yesterday. And you want to talk about a self-centered child, it's a four-year-old at a birthday party. Because everything is revolving around him. But we're no better than he is. Because we know our world and we're proud of it. Because this is our world. We don't want to be inconvenienced. Reconciliation in Paul's mind was the word that encompassed everything that's involved in redemption, in forgiveness, in the costly nature of grace, and the restoration of relationship. In Christ Jesus, God was reconciling the world unto himself. You see, sin had to be paid for. And it was paid for in full at Calvary. But in the last few moments I have with you, I want to remind you of this. If the church is going to be under the cross, and this is the church under the cross, then the church has to take on the role of a servant. As Jesus did, so are we supposed to do. Obedience does not mean success. You know what obedience is? Obedience is a pastor preaching a message that he knows is going to offend you. That's obedience. Obedience is saying, I may not like this and this may not be the best that I think is the best idea, but you know what? For the sake of Moving forward for the church, I'm going to get behind this 110%. Was the Apostle Paul successful? Not by the world standards. You know, William Carey, not the college, but the missionary, served for seven years in India before he had one convert. No ship was built to stay in the harbor. 95% of what the church does, it does inside the walls of the church. And the ministry of Jesus was just the opposite. 95% of what he did was outside the walls of the church. But we become so secure in here, and then we become comfortable in here and heaven forbid that the sound system go out heaven forbid that the air condition go out heaven forbid that we're not on a series that you like because you want to be comfortable a servant of the lord will risk being laughed at ridiculed mocked criticism and they will be they'll still speak out even when it's not comfortable the church of the lord and savior doesn't say Come and sit. It says, come and serve. Has anybody in here ever been to the Great Passion play? 
I'm not talking about the one in Eureka Springs now. <laughs> that is a good one. But the one in Europe. For years, Anton Lang, a Euro- European actor, played the part of Jesus in the Great Passion. And one night after they had done one of their performances or presentations, whatever you want to call it, he had a group of American journalists around him. They were interviewing him. And one of the journalists walked over to the cross that Anton Lang carried every night during that beautiful, beautiful crucifixion scene. He thought it was probably made of styrofoam. So he walks over to this cross and he tries to lift it up and he can't hardly get it up. And so he turns to Anton Lang and he goes, this is the cross you carry every night? He said, yeah, it is. And he said, why don't you use something lighter? It just doesn't seem feasible or it doesn't seem logical that you, he said, pretty much the exact specifications as the best as scholars can tell us of the cross that Jesus bore to Calvary. (laughs) And it's just blowing their minds. And somebody said, Mr. Lang, why would you do that? his response was this, if I can't feel the weight of the cross, I can't play the part. And folks, let me tell you, if I can't feel it, I can't preach it. And if you don't feel the weight of that cross every day, then you're not living it. You're not living. We have been called to be changing elements in the world in which we live. Want to be the church under the cross? Do you? Be careful what you ask for. Because it just might happen. Father, we thank you today for your grace, for your mercy, for they are new each and every day. And your mercies never fail us. In all of our lives, you have been good. And so now, Heavenly Father, in this moment, in this hour, we pray that you would do heart surgery. We pray that you would Give us a determination to step out and to do things that may seem to be uncomfortable. Father, we know that uh, you don't call us to sit still. You don't call us to sit on our hands. You call us to serve. So I just pray today that whatever decision needs to be made in this room, it would be done now. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I just want to tell you this. You need to understand that this group will never meet again. This exact group. This will be the only time this exact group will meet together. And you don't know what next week holds. I'm not trying to coerce you. I'm just asking you to consider your life. One of my greatest encouragers went into the hospital a week ago today and I'm driving back tomorrow to do her funeral see pastors hurt too and you might say well you know don't don't coerce and don't manipulate I'm not I tell you what y'all stop dying I'll stop talking about it But the reality is one out of every one dies. That's the ratio. So there are decisions that need to be made today. And I'm asking you, what are you waiting on? Don't be indifferent. Be a part of a church under the cross. Maybe you're giving your heart to Christ. Maybe you come rededicating your life, transferring a church membership. 
coming to the altar and pray. I tell you what, our church, our church is an altar praying church. I'm telling you, every Sunday, they're down there. You might need somebody to pray with you. Find that person. Your staff's going to be here. I'll let them conclude the time of invitation. But as the Lord leads, don't you hesitate. You come. Pastor. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. Cause your so grateful that we've had the opportunity to be reminded of what your word says about the cross we know your word says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved is the power of God so God thank you for reminding us of our responsibility as believers to live under the cross to not just leave it here but to share your message as we go to school go to work vacation, go on trips, Lord, we are your messengers, and we're so thankful that we've been reminded of that today, and how important it is to recognize that as your servants and your people, it's not going to always be easy. Matter of fact, Lord, it'll be difficult. Your Lord, your boss, and we're grateful that you've reminded us of things that we're supposed to do. And we thank you for this opportunity to give of our resources. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for just a minute. As we take up the offering, I want to remind you of a few things. One is when you exit the building, I'm going to remind Dr. Hurt, Tommy Joe, Kelly, my wife, will be making their way. Y'all can go ahead and make your way back there now. So they'll be there if you want to speak to them, thank them for coming then they certainly are people people and they would love that opportunity if you've not had a chance to speak to them. Did you not enjoy Dr. Hurt's message today? It was great. 
Thank you, Bill. That was, that was powerful and a wonderful reminder, so we're grateful for that. We're looking forward to the next hour and a half or so with our men as he continues to inspire and remind us of our role as servants in the church. Guys, just remember, there should be some, some, peop, some folks out there handing out those invite cards, so if you don't mind, take some and pass them out as you have opportunities. It starts two weeks from this Thursday. Also, this coming Thursday at 5.30 p.m., Dr. Joe McKeever's coming. I think the information's on your worship guide on the front, and if you've not made an effort to say, hey, I want to go here, Dr. McKeever, then make an effort to go here, Dr. McKeever. He's wonderful, very personable, and he's also an artist, and so if you haven't had anybody draw your picture lately, he's your guy. So come if you're, I think, I think senior adults, it depends on who you ask, but I, I think at one time I heard it's 55 up. So if you're 55 or older, you say, well, I don't want to sign up for that group. You don't have to sign up. Just come, enjoy a meal and have fun. I want to ask you now just to stand. And if you're a guest, go by our welcome center, get you a free complimentary bag of resources. And Robert's going to lead us in our dismissal. Wednesday night.